since it's Father's Day, I didn't want to talk just about fathers, but talk about the whole family as a unit. And four ingredients that I think are, that were on my heart that are just so necessary for a healthy, godly marriage and healthy, godly family. And fathers, you being the leaders in the home, this all has to start with you. But the first thing that is a must is a relationship. You have to have a relationship with those people you live with. It's amazing. Some families spend so much effort trying to isolate and insulate themselves from each other and go to their separate rooms and separate headphones and try to ignore each other as much as possible. And that's just the opposite of the way the Christian family, the godly family, is supposed to be. There has to be genuine relationship. Genuine respect, genuine love for one another. There's got to be involvement. It's going to take time, commitment of effort. There's got to be honesty. If you can't be honest with your wife or with your husband or with your family, who are you going to be honest with? And it's a sad state of affairs. It's a sad state of a relationship when you can't share your heart with someone and know that you will be loved and cared for just as much after than before. There's got to be that open communication. So I put there some bullet points. Number one, there are no formulas for parenting. Parenting is by relationship only. And I think you, we really need to keep that in mind for all of our relationships because each person is different and unique and each relationship is different and unique. Each person, each relationship is like a snowflake. There's no two that are alike. I know with, uh, when we were raising Jonathan and Jessica, you know, with Jonathan, we had to raise him kind of by brute force. Jessica, uh, if you just spoke to her sternly, she would break down into tears. So you, there had to be two totally different approaches. They were completely different people, responded differently, had different motivations. John was always pushing the boundaries, no matter what boundary it was. He was trying to push it. Uh, Jessica was very content to stay right in the center of the box, never even touched the boundaries. And so you had two completely different personalities, makeups, and you've got to respect your children enough and respect your spouse enough to realize everybody is different. They are unique. And so if you just think about the relationships you have in this room, you don't relate and interact with everybody in this room the same. Some people you cut up and laugh with more and other people are more serious or more uh, prone to this or that. And so every relationship is different and every relationship has its own rhythm and harmony. And so that takes time and effort to work on. The fact that you are married to who you are married to and that you have the family that you have is no accident. And so God expects you to be faithful to serve them and to love them and to communicate with them. I put their children will learn how to communicate from you. They will watch you. They will listen to you. Your son will learn how to treat his wife by the way you treat his mother. You've got to show them how to be open and honest, and you've got to show them by demonstration. It's okay to open up and be honest and bear your heart and you're going to be just as loved and accepted after as you were before. You're in a safe zone. You're okay here. You have to be open with your children to admit when you're wrong, because as parents, we do a lot of things wrong. I don't know if there's a whole lot that affects a child more than when a parent comes to them and say, I did it wrong, please forgive me. I'm going to try to never do that again. If they don't learn that humility from you, where are they going to learn it? If they don't learn how to open up their heart, you know, in First John it says that if we come to the light as he is in the light, if we learn how to bear our soul and hold nothing back but expose it all to him, that's when he brings the forgiveness and the healing and the cleansing. If children are smacked down every time they bring up something negative or if they are demeaned, or ridiculed every time they try to open up and tell you what's troubling them, and they 
in response, clam up, shut up, and keep it all in, they're never going to be able to find the healing and the help that they need. Because you've trained them through that abuse, that emotional abuse, to keep it all in. And so there's got to be very healthy, open, honest communication within the family. It starts between the husband and the wife, and then that trickles down to the children, and they know that they can always come to you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says it this way, and Peter is addressing this to husbands, but I really think it could apply to any relationship within the family. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. And look at that word understanding. In the Greek, it's the word gnosis. It's the same word that was used for intimate relations between a husband and a wife. It's talking about knowing by experience to where you really dig deep. And you know what the saddest thing is? The saddest thing is most people today are so self-absorbed and self-consumed and self-centered and self-serving that they never even think or consider that other person sitting across the dinner table from them. And they never get involved enough to communicate and to try to help them to to be uh, a confidant, to be someone that they can share with. Most of the time we walk around, we don't even care about that other person. We just want to take care of me. But Peter is saying here something just the opposite. Live with your family in gnosis. Do you really know them? Do you know what motivates them? Do you know their attitudes? Do you know what offends them? Do you know what excites them? Do you know what their faults and weaknesses and what brings them down? Do you know their strengths and what they excel at? Live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Guys, we're here to protect our wives, to shelter them, to care for them, to provide a safe place for them to abide. Verse 8, he goes on and he says, to sum it up, all of you be harmonious. And that word harmonious comes from two Greek words, homo and then phron, which means of one mind. Do you know of one mind doesn't mean that you agree? You don't have to agree to be of one mind, but you have to at least know what that other mind is thinking. And when you know what that other mind is thinking, then you can work together in harmony. You know, when they sing harmony in a quartet, not everybody's singing the same notes, but it's a beautiful blend when it's done right, isn't it? And so he says, be harmonious of one mind. Know the mind of your wife. Know the mind of your husband. Know the mind of your children. Take the time to sit down and talk to them. Be sympathetic means to suffer with. When they hurt, you feel the hurt. The, the compassion compels you to do something. You can't help but react and respond. Be brotherly, from the Greek word philodophos, meaning brotherly love and affection. You know, when you, uh, if, if some of us were to go out to dinner after church and we're sitting around the table and depending on the relationship, you know, you, you, you would probably not want to burp in front of us. But at home, at the dinner table, you let it rip, right? In fact, you've got to outdo your brother and be louder than him, right? Uh, why is that? Because see, this, this word brotherly here, that's what he's talking about. You don't mind doing that at home with your family. Why? Because there's a stability and there's, there's a security there of, look, you've got to love me, I'm family. You're stuck with me, right? I'm not going anywhere. Where he said, that's, that's the brotherly affection that's supposed to be in us, in the church, and at home. We're stuck with each other. We're not going anywhere. We love each other. And there's nothing you can do to make us love you less. Be kind-hearted. Kind-hearted and sympathetic, there are very similar terms. And so I think it's interesting that Peter, by the Holy Spirit, is repeating it. Be tender-hearted. Hurt when someone hurts. 
Be moved with compassion. Be sympathetic. If there's nothing you can do for them in the natural, pray for them. Pour your heart out for them. Be humble in spirit. That word humble in spirit, see the first definition there? That's literally what it means. It means to be friendly of mind. Have you ever tried to have a conversation or tried to greet an arrogant person and they were so stuck on themselves that just they, they were just a snob, right? And you really couldn't get any traction in the conversation because they were looking down at you the whole time. But the humble in spirit, it's someone who doesn't have a high opinion of themselves. They have a modest opinion of themselves. And so because of that, they're easy to approach. They're not snobbish. You don't feel minimized when you talk to them. They take an interest in you. They love you. They're concerned for you. And so that's the environment that we need to create in, in the home. There needs to be relationship. Take the time to be involved. And once again, you know, this culture that we live in is pulling everybody out of churches. Well, the same culture that we live with are pulling families apart. And whenever you see a family pulled apart and divided, it's the work of the devil. It's not the work of God. And so the best way that you can confront those powers of darkness trying to pull your family apart is to be aggressive and proactive and being involved and communicate in relationship. Secondly, there's got to be unconditional love and affection. Never, ever, ever make your family qualify for your love. How blasphemous can you get when the Son of God came and died for you on the cross? and all of your sin and shame and filth and pollution and vomit and blood. And then you are so stuck up and self-righteous that you make someone else earn your love. Can there be any other greater blasphemy? You love them because God loved you when you didn't deserve it. You love them because that's what love does. Love loves. You love them because they're, they are your own flesh and blood. Love them without conditions because of the love God has demonstrated to you. Choose to commit and love even though you know there will be failures. That's the tough one. Because we don't want to be hurt. And we don't want to suffer the consequences that you bring on the marriage or that you bring on the family. But let's face it, none of us are married to Jesus, so there's going to be failures. There's going to be offenses. There's going to be wounds. You better be committed to forgive. You better be willing to have love cover a multitude of sins. Because in every family, there's a multitude. And if you're not willing to commit to cover the multitude of sins, then you better never get married and you better go live on as a hermit up on a mountain where all you can offend is yourself. You've got to choose. I am with you till the end. Love and embrace them the same way to the same degree in the good and the bad, the successes and the failures. And this is very important. Convince your children that when they are young that you will always be there to love them, embrace them, care for them, no matter what they've done or what has happened. Someone needs to make this very real. The teenagers, before they decide to get pregnant, this is a life commitment. I'm going to be there for you through life or death, heaven or hell, no matter what it takes. And just like the prodigal son and the father, you're going to be looking for them every day, every hour, if they ever depart. But that's the love that God has called us to. And nothing less than that is acceptable by God's standard. 
There is a caveat that I need to add to this, and I don't want to spend time on it. But you can get into situations where people start taking advantage of you selfishly. And when the pearls that you're casting before them to try to help them, they turn and rend you. And so when the relationship turns abusive or toxic, then what does Jesus say to do? Don't keep casting your pearls. That's, that's a boundary that you don't cross, right? But that's last resort. That's way out there. We don't even go there in our minds until, I mean, when, when you have to go to that place, you will know that it's time to go to that place. In your mind, you don't even go there. You're just concentrated on whatever you need. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm going to love you and embrace you through the worst and through the best. Loving unconditionally can mean the difference between Peter and Judas. And I mean this with all my heart. And I hope that you take what I'm saying very seriously. It can be life and death for some people. Peter, after he went out and wept bitterly, having denied the Lord three times, why didn't he do what Judas did and just hang himself, just get it over with? Because he knew he had a group of men that he could go back to who would forgive him and love him. No different than before. Judas thought life was over. He thought no one would ever trust him again. The disciples would never want to see him again. And do you know the sad part about it? The disciples would have received him back just like they did Peter. Because what these two men did was really no different. One just got money for it. But it was the same betrayal. Judas had a place back there, just like Peter did. But somehow in his mind, he thought, I can never go back. I can never return. They will always hate me. They will always reject me. I might as well just go ahead and get it over with. And so if you don't convince your children from the time they're young that you are with them till the end. You will love them, embrace them, care for them, no matter what they do or no matter what happens. They've got to know they have a place that they can always go home to where they won't be ridiculed or minimized or condemned or humiliated. Not that you tolerate the sin. You won't do that because sin destroys but you will love them and embrace them. Peter learned this lesson here in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, when Jesus was telling him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail you. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But Peter said, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. There's that self-confidence, the cockiness. He knew better than the Lord. But Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times. Deny three times that you know me. You know this had to stick with Peter. And after he went out and wept so bitterly, crushed, broken because of what he had done. Do you know in the midst of his weeping and sobbing, there had to be a moment of brightness, a moment of a glimmer of hope where Peter must have realized, wait a minute, Jesus knew this was going to happen before I did it. He told me this was going to happen. Not only that, he told me that he was praying for me. Now, see, of all sins, it's not like Peter went out and stole some money from a stranger. This was a sin that was personally targeting Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I don't know you. I mean, Jesus could have been very personally offended by this, right? It could have become a very divisive, very personal betrayal, But do you see Jesus look beyond his own hurt 
looked beyond the offense, and he said, Peter, I'm praying for you. I don't care what what you do. I just don't want your faith to fail. I don't want you to give up. And then after you recover yourself from this denial, I want you to go tell your brothers, strengthen them, tell them just because they failed, they don't have to give up. There's hope, there's forgiveness, there's redemption in Jesus Christ. You can come home, there will always be someone there to love you and to take care of you. If we don't give people that safe place to come home to, they will never come home. We've got to be there for them. Just like Jesus was there for Peter. And he said, Peter, even though this will happen, I'm for you. I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to be offended and leave you. I'm praying for you. And when you come back, I've got a job for you to do. What great hope. What great purpose. Peter, when he came back, knew that the Lord wanted him, that the Lord had a job for him to do. And what great redemption in all of this. Thirdly, there has to be consistent, constructive, and compassionate discipline in the home with the children. Consistent discipline. They've got to learn that truth and good and evil are non-negotiable. They are absolute. Good and evil is not subjective nor situational. The truth is absolute, and it's the truth all the time. It doesn't change. Regardless of how you feel, think, or the circumstance, truth does not change. When they don't know, you know, when today it's okay to throw the ball in the house, and then tomorrow it's not okay to throw the ball in the house, they're thinking, well, gee, I wonder what tomorrow will bring. What will be right and wrong tomorrow? And that's a petty example, but I'm just using it as an example. There has to be consistency, or else they will never get the message, God's laws do not change. The law that you will be judged by does not change. There has to be consistency, and consistency is the hardest thing for us as adults, because how many of you, if you've told your child once, you've told them a thousand times, No or yes or whatever, right? But that's what kids do. They push the boundaries. And you do have to tell them a hundred times, a thousand times, again and again. But you know there's hope. You know, we we saw it with, with Jonathan. I don't know what age it was, but it was at some age, uh, late teens where something just clicked. And all of a sudden he got it. I don't, and it will be, and it will happen that way with your children as well. Even grown children, don't ever give up. And no matter if you've been inconsistent in the past, don't worry about that. Ask for forgiveness. God takes care of all of that. Start being consistent today. And God will honor and and prosper that consistency. Secondly, the discipline has to be constructive. I put there in that Second to the last line, discipline is not the parent's revenge. Right? You made my day miserable, I'm going to make you miserable. And sometimes you feel like that, right? You feel like this is payback, man, and I'm paying you back. Have any of you ever disciplined your child and it actually felt good? (laughs) You vented a little bit, didn't you? All of us have been there. But in the long run, in the long haul of it all, we've, the discipline has got to be constructive. The discipline can never be destructive, abusive, vengeful, vindictive, injurious. So many parents, they don't discipline their children for the child's good. They discipline their children to vent their frustrations or to try to just 
get rid of the kids, put some distance between me and the kids so I don't have to put up with you anymore. And they use discipline in that way instead of really trying to use discipline to build character in the child. Just remember, when I, when I give this spanking or when I give this time out or when I scold you in this way, whatever you do to discipline them in the moment will have lasting results and effects in their life. They're learning from you how God treats us as sons and daughters. And so are you giving them an accurate picture? When God disciplines us, it's always corrective and it's always for our good to develop maturity and temperance and understanding in us. So when you discipline them for doing something wrong, you're not disciplining them because it ticked you off and you're paying them back. You're disciplining them to aid them in temperance because this will help you control yourself for the next time. And you know that, that subtle difference in attitude makes all the difference? You don't even have to say a word and your child knows when you're disciplining them in anger or when you're disciplining them with their best interest at heart. They know the difference. They can see it on your face. They can feel the vibe. They know the attitude. They can see it. One look in your eyes tells them all they need to know. So you need to make sure that the discipline is coming with the honorable intention and motive of this is going to build godliness in you. Lastly, the discipline needs to be compassionate. It's got to be compassionate. Have you lived so long that you've forgotten what it's like to be a kid? You've forgotten what it's like to be a teenage teenager with no brains? Make sure that you administer the discipline in loving gentleness and mercy, not with anger or harshness or humiliation. When you discipline with anger or harshness or humiliation, you can heap so much self-condemnation on that child that they come to the place of Judas of, there's no reason for me to live. They hate me. They reject me. But first of all, be mindful and sympathetic of the power of the flesh. Think of the last time you committed a sin knowingly. And you, for whatever reason, felt unable to stop the urge. And how old are you? And that just happened a day or two ago? And now you're dropping the hammer on some child? If you have trouble controlling your urges, don't you think they have trouble? And I'm saying all that, that's not to excuse the sin. You still have to deal with what they did. You still have to deal with the sin, but you do it with a measure of compassion mixed in. And you know what? They will pick up on the compassion, and they will sense it, and they will appreciate it, and they will keep, it will be, uh, they will keep, they will be mindful of it. And then lastly, having personally experienced the mercy and the forgiveness of God, Oh, Lord, if it wasn't for his mercy and forgiveness, we would all be in hell right now. We would all be under the judgment of God. And so in your discipline, you don't, you, you, there's a real delicate balance. You don't overlook the sin. You address the sin, but you apply mercy with the retribution at the same time, and you give them the sense of, wow, it, it could have been so much worse. Dad could have been so much madder. That spanking could have been so much harder. There's mercy. And I'm not saying that you do that all the time or repeatedly or let them go scot-free. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying there's got to be compassion. You've got to remember this is just a child. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, verse, uh, starting in verse 4 this famous passage, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, 
and when you rise up. Verse 7 is all about application. It's not about teaching your children doctrine. It's about application. Son, daughter, this is what we do when we lie down. This is what we do when we rise up. When we walk by the way and we're tempted by over there by what's on the sidewalk, we just keep walking and look the other way. This, and you start to apply the Word of God to everyday situations, everyday life, and you teach them that there is only one lens to view this world through, the lens of the Bible, the Word of God. This is the only way to view this world. This is the only way to view these circumstances. This is the only way to view when that happens to you, when someone does that to you. And so as you go through life, sitting in the house, walking in the way, lying down, rising up, you very consistently deliver the Word of God, and you just talk to them. And you say, this is what Jesus did when he encountered this. This is what Father would want us to do under these circumstances. And you begin to apply the Word of God to their heart. It has to be constructive. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Provoking your children to anger is destructive discipline of the bad kind, where you leave your child wounded and hurt, condemned, overcome, feeling as though there's no purpose for them to be alive, feeling as though they're stupid, feeling as though they can never do anything right, feeling as though they have to somehow measure up and earn or deserve your love. That's how you provoke them to anger. Don't discipline with that kind of destructive discipline, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, where it's good and healthy and loving and kind, and it's for their best, and it brings out the best in them, and it helps to curb their passions, and it helps to instill in them virtues. That's the kind of discipline. It's the kind of discipline that will save their soul from hell. But it's administered in the love and in the mercy of God. We're running out of time, so I'm going to skip over Galatians 4, but that's a good one to read on your own. And then lastly, this compassionate discipline that we were talking about. Psalms 103, verse 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children. All right, so the discipline is to be with compassion. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. You know, when I sin and I have to go to the Lord and ask forgiveness... This verse regularly comes to my mind. God, you know my frame. You know I'm but dust. You know apart from you I can do nothing. You know how weak I am, how needy I am. You know how apart from you I can't do anything good or right. Show some of that compassion to your children. Let them see how understanding God is. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 it says that Jesus had to be made like us, made like his brethren in all things. He was tempted by the lust of the flesh, tempted by the lust of the eyes, tempted by the pride of life, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. You've been there. You know what it's like. That should make you merciful. Jesus was here. He knows what it's like. That's why he's merciful to forgive you and me. That's why he's quick to forgive us and extend mercy, because he was made like us. He knows how rotten and filthy it can be to live in this world. Verse 18, he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. Because he's been tempted in that way, because he's suffered being tempted, he's able to come to the aid of us when we need help, because he knows what it's like. So have that compassion towards your children. Discipline must be consistent, it must be constructive, not destructive, and it must be compassionate. And then last, 
Be an example of biblical godliness to them. Be an example of the Bible. Be the walking Bible in your house. Not just spouting it out of the mouth all the time, but living it, doing it, applying it properly. Words bring instruction to the mind, but your example goes far deeper, molding the heart, making the child who they are. I put there, your child may or may not hear what you say. And most... You know, they really are listening a lot more than we think they are. We think it goes in one ear and out the other, but they actually heard it. They will tell you they've heard it a thousand times, but they did actually hear it. But they will be who and what you are. They might hear what you say, but they will definitely be who and what you are. And I, you know, I don't know how this works, to be honest. I think it's part genetic. I think it's part spiritual. But your children really do end up just like you. Even the ones who say, I rebel against my parents and I'll never be like them, they end up just like them. When you demonstrate and exemplify the Word of God in your words and actions, you're planting the seed of the Word of God in their hearts, and you, you have the promise that it will grow. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 11. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. When you exemplify, when you say and do the word of God in your home with your family, that is planting a seed of righteousness in their hearts that will not return to God empty you have a guarantee of growth. A guarantee. Think of how powerful that is. When you exemplify the Word of God, that Word will be sown into their heart and do things that you could never do as a parent on your own. You have the promise it will not return to God empty. It will accomplish what He desires. It will succeed in the matter for which He sent it. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is what? Sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. That's why he's saying, don't split up the marriage. Otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are what? Now, he doesn't give any details, and he doesn't really explain what's happening invisibly, spiritually, behind the scenes, but somehow your influence is rubbing off. And when you live and do and believe and speak the Word of God, you are carving and forming and molding that little child's soul. And they are imbibing and absorbing far more than you can even imagine. And because they are imbibing and absorbing the Word of God being spoken and lived out, you have guarantees that that Word will work in their heart for all of the years of their life. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, even... The influence that you have on that child, it never wears out. It never gets old. It never gets left behind. It never gets forgotten. Your children will never forget mom and dad. You have the single most impact of their life greater than anybody else outside of God. Use it wisely. Train up a child in the way he should go. Stop harping on past mistakes. Start today, and today can make a world of difference in the economy of God. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when it's old, that influence, that impact that you had on that life will never leave that child. Doesn't that give you hope? Gives me hope. So regardless of what you see right now, your influence lives on in their heart. And up till the day they die, they'll never be able to get away from it. 
My mom's been passed on for how many years now? I can still hear her voice calling my name. Richard. (laughs) That's the kind of impact you have on your kid's life. Father, we thank you for the precious families that you've given us. Fathers, as fathers and as mothers, Lord, help us to treasure our children. Help us to never see them as an inconvenience or a bother or an interruption or a hindrance. But Father, let us see that it's we are here as parents to deliver this child to heaven one day. We are here as parents to place this child into your loving arms, to commit them into your will. We are here as parents to point the way and provide the momentum to carry them along in the stream of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to love them unconditionally. Help us to truly know them. And not just get through relationship and get through life with the least amount of effort, but... Help us to apply the time and the effort to really know one another. Father, let the discipline be consistent and compassionate. The sin has to be addressed. Sin destroys whatever it touches, so it can't be tolerated. but the soul we can pull from the fire with tears of compassion. Father, thank you for the priceless gift. Our wife is a priceless gift. Our husband is a priceless gift. Our children are priceless. They are the true treasures of this life. Nothing else in this life we can take with us. But when we go to heaven, we can take our families with us. We can take the relationships that we've built with us. So Father, help us to treasure what's really important and invest in what really matters. Instead of in all of the cheap amusements of the world. Father, we give you the praise and we thank you for this time. We lift Ryan and Neil and Dottie and Joni up to you again and just pray for your mercy, for your healing, for your comfort, for your deliverance. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.